Chris Bellarat of HobbyGameDev.com, and today I'll be giving a quick crash course on how to use Unity quickly and easily to make small, simple games. It's really what we spend a lot of time on. Uh, I'm assuming you have no background in using the tools, uh, and we'll start to see some merit to having built a simple card drive kit. I want to point out that even though the focus of today's tutorial is a card driving game, a lot of the sort of premise that we use to build the set methods and general navigation of the Unity tool will really map to any game in any genre, whether you're going back to the uh, platformer, sci-fi horror, whatever it might be, even a puzzle game. So to begin with, let's show you the Unity build. That's that's probably a good place to start. So for that, we're going to go to hobbygamedev.com slash unity slash simple car. And you can see here we have our little car that drives around the environment. It stops off the hills. We go down to the edge. We climb to the middle. Uh, it's got a few extra features on here, so I push the car, I press the button to reorient it. And also these different corners look really neat, so I can adjust those in both with the camera and with the sort of a, a quick and low pace kind of car uh, form of a first person view. I can take it up and down. And an isometric panel to make sure I can get by with it quickly and efficiently. And then slide and retreat gives you slightly to the far back to the middle of the world. Okay, so let's see how this is put together. I've gone to unitytv.com, Unity is just the website, and downloaded the tool. Uh, it is free to use, uh, and you know if, if you want to pay more, there are additional features you can get, but the, the free version really is uh, covering all that we'll need from high performance to low performance. So when it's downloaded, you will open Unity, uh, and you'll need to create a new project. So let's go to File, New Project, and we're going to refer to the new project here with Simple Car HTTP. So I've chose to do this at Hobby Game Dev. You can name, of course, the project anything that you would like. We don't need any of these uh, important packages, but if you want these special links, you can do so. So we're ready to create project. So we have a new empty screen. And we need to get our game started. I want to encourage you, if you're not already, to be using a two button mouse. If you have a two button mouse, plug it in. Uh, it is very, very useful on a Mac. Don't try to do it with a, with a one button trackpad. Using Unity in general with a trackpad is not going to go as well. You're, you're not going to have a good time. Uh, so the first thing we need to do is let's build a car out of stone here. So let's go over into the to game object, create other uh, cube. few basic camera navigation notes. You can hold down the middle mouse button with the mouse wheel and drag and drop. And if you hold down uh, Alt and left click and drag, you can orbit. Uh, if you zoom in and out, you use the mouse wheel. And perhaps most importantly, if you're uh, fielding this oriented in space, you have an object selected, you can press up or the mouse over the viewport and it'll center view on your object. So if I'm, I'm willing to turn this to lock, and then my car is just the cube, cube that I made, I can double click it and it zooms. Or if it's already selected, mouse over the viewport, press up to view, and it will zoom in on it uh, in focus on your space. So now to build this cube into a car, so I put the sprite design, have the car, and again, this has the name for any field I decide. I'm going to transform it. That'll become the body of the car. I duplicated it by clicking on it in the hierarchy, and then I use Command V, Control V for your Windows users, uh, or you can go to Edit Tool Window. So now it's a second one. I'm going to drag that up. I'm going to make it the top of the car. I'm going to make it kind of a small form. Create other. I'm going to use a cylinder for the tires on the car. Now to rotate. Uh, we could use this gizmo to rotate it by hand, and there's even a way to rotate with the mouse. But instead, because I want it exactly 90 degrees, I'm just going to type in 90 and my hand wheel. And it's fine, the mouse will do most of the work. I'll double the direction I want for wheels, make it a bit smaller. Let's put the wheel here. Make it a little bit bigger. Additionally, I'll make it 
of rental cars and a group of trainers. Group of trainers. And the Pacific Eleven is area oriented. You can move it around just by asking the woman at the end of the line. So there, so we have a simple car made in our state. And we now need to make all these uh, under a single app. So to make it easy to manipulate the car as, as a whole to do so. So the way that you go about creating kind of a folder on Delta Community is to create a empty grant folder. So now we just create an empty fill in the menu. And this will be our parent for the car. So let's rename this to car all. And then we click and drag each of these pieces we just made into car all. So now in addition to manipulating each of these parts, we can move Delta Moon Grant car all to the side to move it all into one. To make the ground and to make a new cube for that, we'll now just create other cubes. To move it below the car, we'll make one below the car. To scale, you can do anything you want. I'm going to make mine in 20 by 1 by 20, giving us the same type of thing, scale value. Do a scan there. So when we hit play, our we have kind of a weird view of the scene. Right? We've got the silhouette, which the Holy Trinity, you and I know that's a car from Clerks, but they're they're viewed from life. And so to solve that problem, we're going to add a light. We'll now just create a directional light. We'll click under here. And to print what a point light, what a spotlight, or an area light, we need a number of them to properly light a scene. Directional light looks kind of like sunlight. So let's just type one, and that will light everything. Uh, it'll create a beautiful look in your car. The position in space actually doesn't matter. Uh, this is orientation. So you can go and use those arrows to, to drag it away from the car. Uh, you'll notice I mouse over these ones like up, but it doesn't matter. Uh, if you go zoom in, you can go and use the rotation widget up here to start playing some words. using the light so we can get a little better view of the car shape there. Uh, but our camera view still isn't very good for this empty car. So what we're going to do now is uh, click on the car, now click on viewport plus X, and then zoom back out. And finally, since we never move the viewport usually, this is a viewport like you would like for gameplay purposes. It could be right here in this position or here in the corner looking down. Then we're going to click on main camera go to the game object align your scene. And what this does is it takes our viewport and sets up the main camera to match the scene we're putting away. So, so now when we hit play, we see that our camera here has, has changed to the view that we expected uh, based on the way we set up our viewport. You will notice, by the way, that when I, whenever I press play, mine turns a prettier screen. Yours probably isn't. Yours probably turns a, a shade of gray. Uh, this is actually a pretty important thing to know about uh, and we'll show you how to set it up. And the reason why we why I make mine an ugly green, I encourage people to make it pink or blue or whatever you need, is that while you're in this mode, you can still modify values in the editor. And the risk is that while you're doing this, this starts to test it. It's going to move a character into the room or out of the room or move the wall or whatever. These changes get lost. And what's even more confusing is to press pause. Because when you're back in your normal editor, you can still make changes anything you want to do, but as soon as you press play to, you know, uh, go back out back into editing, you lose all those changes that you made while you were in play mode. And so it's important to be able to tell very easily whether or not you're in play mode so you don't make changes and then lose things. So if you do that with a little Unity preferences, it'll be in a slightly different location than Windows, but you won't need to find it. And then your preferences play mode change if you see anything. By default, it's just a different shade of gray. I don't think it's a severe enough difference to be something ugly and eye-catching that it would be very obvious to you when you were in play mode. Okay, so we have a directional light. We have a camera position. Uh, we've got our play mode change changed. Uh, we've got a car under a camera. And so now let's make our car have some gravity. So to do that, we're going to select car all. We're going to go to components, visit, widget body. 
And this will add widget body here in the inspector for call out for our ROP. And if we use that here, check. So when we press start, you'll see the car drop a little bit from the front. Pretty cool. This is a test. Let's let's take our ground key. Sorry, I'm putting kind of a key that's the name of the inspector. Let's hit an IRP, and now we're going to rename tube to ground. Uh, now let's rotate the ground. Give it an index, just so we can see when we have to worry about gravity. It's not working for our car. So let's give that a better name. Press super. Press start. And yeah, there we go. Okay, so gravity clearly is working for our automobile. We're in place now. We're back to zero. Flatten out the ground. Uh, let's give the car some headlights. Uh, let's since we're in place uh, directly next to the scene, we want to give the car uh, spotlights. So first, let's zoom in on the car. Click on the car's body and press F. And go to zoom out to two other spotlights. So point light is like a round light that we're that we're looking at. So the spotlight is directly where we want it for the car's headlights. And you can see that it starts pointing down. And using the little click gizmo, click one of the W, E, and R switch switches. By the way, to break the command. Uh, w to move, G to rotate, R to switch. And again, I'm rotating on the surface so it gets better control over the uh, the ground level. And I can see here that roughly what I want is this one close to zero. Uh, we can go to render zip out so it doesn't light towards the head. Gizmo W to kind of zoom in. And we're directing one of our headlights to. I'm going to move the spotlight inside the car wall so that it will move when the car does. And then I'm duplicating the move line to the opposite side of the car. And now when I press start, the headlights here now will light up. And we're moving this a little further. So I'll press those headlights. Use the rotation gizmo to point them down a little bit more. And now it'll be much more apparent when I press go. Boom, there's the car's headlights. Now currently the ground is in the same state as everything else. Uh, I'm gonna take a sketch here of the car. Let's create a new material. So for that we're going to go to assets, create material. Launch it from owner. We'll name it scrap. And if you ever need to rename something, you rename it the same way you do in your operating system. So on that, that means click on it and then wait. Or you can al alternatively press enter and then rename it. Uh, if you're on Windows, I believe F2 will do the same. And all we're going to change for the grass is to show its main color. Let's click on this white box. It'll change it kind of a, a grassy green. And now we need to assign this material from our project onto the grass. So we can actually drag it directly here onto any object we want to assign it to. In my case, the ground. And when we click on ground, now we'll see material here come to appear. It is worth pointing out that this material is a shared resource. So if we assign grass to more than one object and we change it to any of them, it will change the grass color or material properties for all objects. Now the next thing we want to do is we want to make the car drivable. So let's go to assets, create, C-sharp switch. Uh, we want to say that JavaScript, GUI switch, and C-sharp switch can all be used to do entirely the exact same thing. I encourage C-sharp switch if nothing else because in C-sharp it's a little better at keeping the action of the character capitalization in order than the JavaScript that you may be familiar with. So instead of moving here to switch, let's name this car driver. Okay? Now the first thing we're going to do is we're going to assign car driver switch to car R. So we haven't even written the car driver switch yet, but we want to assign it so that we don't write the switch and everything is broken because it's not working. So we'll do it, we're going to drag it from project here on to hierarchy on top of car all. And under the inspector, you'll see my bar here got longer. You see the car driver switch here in car all selected in the hierarchy. Let's double click on the car driver switch to open it in modern develop. And you can see from the default comments and the default functions as such that call owner of the switch comes into creation and update is called every second. Let's add this code into the update function. Diff input dot switch key key code 
about seven years ago. Then transform that position. Press the transform back forward. And back to on the left. Add the time. Back down to the time. So this looks kind of complicated. Uh, you get used to some of this. It's not really a pixel mess in between. The if statement is something that if the key button W is held down this way, then this will fire every frame that the key is held down. Then it will add to the current position the forward vector from the direction of the initial stroke to the original frame, which will still make it move the direction held by the stroke right now. Times 5 is a sort of royal setting of speed for now, just so it's more noticeable. Uh, we'll make this number change again here in a minute. And time delta time is necessary because the update function just holds every frame, and depending on the machine's persistence spec, the frame rate may be much higher or much lower. And by multiplying by the amount of time that passes between frames like this, we get a consistent speed in descending frames. So we're going to save the script, control F or command F, depending on the OS, and let's try it. Let's say, now when I press W, oh, I just see my car is going backwards. Seems like nothing is good. Yeah, so that's, and I should have known this just because of the axis uh, is pointing this direction. So now I'm swift, it looks like, more than anything in time. Oh, I can't control F or command F. Uh, we're going to wait for time to come back into play. There we go. Now we press play. Sure enough, W is rising higher. Forward. Let's make it so we can turn the car. Let's try a new if statement. If input dot get key equals dot a. Then here we're going to do transform dot rotate. Give the gear up. And we'll give it 80 percent AS and time dot delta time. Give the gear up. Something else I'd like to point out uh, is that transform is implied to be the position, location, and scale data of the object that we've assigned the script to. So if we did, uh, if we had a reference to some other game object, we could do that reference dot transform and get the position, location, and scale of that object. If we don't specify a game object, then it just games against the, the one that we assigned the script to, or in this case, car all. We're going to copy and paste the frame code over to the D key, and remove the negative. And with this, what this is doing is it's calling a rotate function, and then just the same function spec in cases. And rotate, uh, there's many ways you can call the rotate function. The one I'm using here is we give it the angle to turn along each axis, so we want to rotate zero along the x-axis, uh, 80 degrees to the left in this case, the negative, in the y-axis, which is the one that goes up and down the wheel. Again, times delta time, to accommodate for a variable frame rate, and 0.0f along the z-axis, which is the one that you don't want to vary. And if we test this now, we save the script, press play, and the car should now rotate and drive. I'm going to reverse the action now button again. And you can, of course, you can drive it off the edge of the world if you so choose. This is now reversed. This is a very simple change. We're going to duplicate the code that we had for moving it forward. Add to the F key. And we're going to subtract instead of add uh, that movement amount. And this rail function is going to actually be two so that we can get the backwards while the other one can move forward. So I'm taking forward and changing the speed. I will say that there is a, a more robust way to handle input that allows the user to remap the two codes. So, uh, you know, you could also use the AO or the use for if those weren't had. That won't be covered here, but I will show you that example of that in the final course that we'll start in about a week, at the end. So again, let's save that, press play, and we can now drive the car around pretty neatly and take it off the edge of the world. You might be wondering, how do I know those, those things that I'm doing inside the script? How do I know those exist? Unity actually has a great script reference. 
unity3d.com slash support slash documentation slash git reference index.html. And it's the link right on the site. Uh, it just provides all kinds of helpful information about what Mitten can and can't do in Git. And more examples of Git to uh, be brought to Docs and GitHub. We just have these numbers floating around 5 and 2 and negative 80. So what we're going to do is we're going to make these two modifiable to our client. Here inside of our class for car driving in a car driving script, we're going to add public float forward speed of 5.0x. We're going to do the backward speed of 2.0x and turn rate equal 80. So we have three public float variables. Speed to speed x has to be 0 by the starting keyword h for float as opposed to the double speed value. And down here we're going to associate these three numbers we have with the variables. Forward speed and backward speed. I'm auto-completing by the way, but just in case I forget, we're going to keep that for the ones that already have. Turn rate and turn rate. Okay, so all we've done is we've made three public variables and we've placed where they were in the code down here. Saved the script. And now if you click on car all in the editor and scroll down in your inspector, you'll see that three of these numbers are inferred. Forward speed, backward speed, and turn rate. And it inferred those names based on how it camel cursed these variable names. We had called it turn rate with a capital R, so it knew that turn rate was the word. And we can change these numbers here. So if we make car drive forward uh, much faster, we'll change it five to turn rate. And room now is, is so much faster than it was previously. We want to make it move much slower. Change that number. Slow it down to a five. So it's like this is a really powerful way to make it so you can create an object and then change it inside the editor um, on a per case basis. Or, for example, if your programming routine wants to set it something that way by tuning, and then have the designer on the team worry about how to get the project uh, to be resolved using the behavior and affair method in a useful manner. Some advanced uh, sort of use feature hints that we are manipulating a car's position directly by changing its transform position. Because it is a rigid body, another way that we could move the object is to apply physical forces to it. And that works a bit differently. Uh, instead of update, we would use the function shift update. And instead of transform position for our code, we would instead do something that says rigid body dot add force vectors uh, to transform dot forward. And this would apply a forward force to the car of a certain magnitude. Uh, this is a certain type of gameplay that it leads to. I find it sluggish. Um, of course, if for, for games that are physics based, it's important to use forces when you can derive the code you need. Also note that I did a consist update. The difference between shift update and update is that shift update is called a known number of times every second, unlike update, which is frame rate increments. And so it's important to use shift update for any code that does physical manipulation of the rigid body or the vehicle or objects. We were able to use rigid body there for transform, since it implies that it's the rigid body assigned to the game object to get uh, forward. Now let's add a sphere to make hills. We're going to go to game object, create other sphere. We have a sphere here. Let's make this a, let's change the size of it. I'm going to do four, zero point seven four to make it short. Flat hill. Make it uh, so it's halfway underground. And it's up to a maximum density of point seven zero zero six. Okay. And so now let's just leave it white. Try driving over it, and you will initially encounter that it is it is going to flip your car. Uh, it's very, very oddly tall for how big it looks. And see, the reason for that is because by default, a sphere uses spherical collision, which is why we see this big sphere around it. That's where the car is hitting. Uh, so there's a faster calculation of how can we do a collision so it's clearly not just what we really wanted. Uh, component physics mesh collider, 
of the message of the current would appear the first or next Sunday, whatever, and turn it to this next collateral. Uh, call it to this place because it's saying we already have a field collateral here. And now what we use the mesh data, the polygons of our of our space, instead of assuming it's a sphere, just to look nice. And so now we have a much more modest bump that's hard to ride over. And that makes it a smooth, jagged scale that we can work with. While we're here creating the fine graph for the hair, so it blends in a bit better, let's create a, a better system for our camera. One way to do this, sort of a, a very easy, I won't say lazy way to do it, uh, is we just click on the vehicle and move our camera, move our viewport around to where we'd like it to be for a first person camera. And then we'll click on main camera to do the same trick from earlier. Our zoom object align with view, try to put the camera where our view is. And then it'll stay there. But if we make a child of car, car R, then it will move along our topogra. So now it's a third person camera. But this is like an extremely rigid camera. Uh, this isn't very nice. It's not very smooth. We don't have as much control over uh, sort of making it lag behind the car or, or any effects like that. So let's move the camera back our car R. And then for shape control, this camera will just shift. So we'll do offset, create, resharp, shift. And we'll call this car cam. So when I click this car cam, going through our system model, uh, we are going to create two new variables. Public camera view cam. Public transform cast object. And then inside the update function, we're going to tell use camera a transform to look at the cast object. And now the way this is being set up, we can specify any camera, uh, it can cast any object, and it will constantly point this way at that object. We could have the object assume that what we're behind it to is the camera or for the object to be tracked. Uh, instead, we've written this configuration of swamp and mouse, probably used to show how to make those connections inside the editor through various ways. And this will also, by crystallizing it in this fashion, make it easier for us to change the ways that the camera can be uh, switched between if we want to have multiple cameras supported. So let's go back to the editor. And let's see now we have our car cam script, but it's not really assigned to anything. It doesn't really matter what it's assigned to, it's assigned to our car just for some reason. And now when we scroll down here, see our car cam wants to know which camera to cast this object. And there's two ways to do this. The one that I like is to drag here from the hierarchy main camera onto where it says use camera, and it fills in that slot. We have the camera information from that object. Now for track object, we want to transform, and I could drag car all onto it. Instead, I'm going to click on this slot next to it, which gives me a list of everything that has a transform, all the things that I could have dragged onto it, I can click car all, go ahead and click that, and it fills in with a transform of car all. So now when I drive around, the camera is constantly following the car. Kind of a, a magical cat. So if either of us see this one, we'll just ride away. There's other ways for you to control the camera, uh, to switch between cameras. I'll include the source for that in the final version, but I'm not going to show you here. Let's add more hairs, though. So go ahead and duplicate the hair, go ahead and control D. I also want to say that just like there's this green arrow we can drag up and down with, there's a green square which allows us to drag it perpendicular to that axis. In the case of our hills, there's a really handy way to keep them flush to the ground while we change their dimensions. So you can have them sort of go you know, from bigger hills to smaller hills, longer hills. really no harm in them overlapping, uh, as the kind of shape that you want. Uh, oops. There we go. And now when I drive my car around on them, bounce around, they stay right here. But, oh, the color is half a day. Again. Or we can still drive. Whatever. Let's do that with another one. 
um, but we want to give the car away to the Orionist Fund when it gets built. It's kind of like the War Pond Flotilla. Before we do it, let's just do a little bit of cleanup. We have these wheels floating around, all those good sails. We're going to set that free. And then we want to build the thing up. Uh, and we had a couple ground objects. Let's make some children of the ground objects just so we can organize. Yeah. Inside of our, our car driver script, we want to add a new key to the oriented car. Let's make that the X key. And that's going to allow us to do the same thing in Cosmic Code. So, check that. Except now instead of get key, we're going to use get the car. We're going to get key back. And the difference here is that whereas get key triggers every frame to be a turn, get key balance only does it in the first frame of the queue for the thing. Because we don't want to do this constantly because then it only has one frame to be the thing. So we're going to do several things to the car when the X key is checked. Transform.position. That gives us vector 3.x. This will lift the car one unit off the ground. We're using vector 3.x because it's an objective x vector. If we add in said transform.x, it would be up from relative to the car. So if the car is on its side, this would be you know, east or west, depending on where the car is rolled over. It could even be balanced. The car is upside down. But by adding vector 3.x, it's an objective x vector. It will always be away from the ground. Going to the rigid body dot velocity equals vector three dot zero, and this will stop movement of the car. So if there's any little tumbling, it will stop its lateral movement. And related to this tumbling is we're going to set the angular velocity to vector three dot zero, so to prevent it from rolling. Uh, otherwise, when we reorient, it will just keep having that roll component. And then lastly, we're going to do one that's going to be a little fancier looking. Transform.rotation equals quaternion.lookRotation transform.forward vector3.x. Uh, I broke down here just for my low resolution editor and I'm using it for this, but it can attack this. Um, you don't have to worry about breaking down all those rules if I already went past. Transform forward is telling it the direction to maintain for the way the car should be pointed. Vector3.x is telling it which vector to make upright. Uh, and so this is going to make our car um, sit upright. Otherwise, all we would be doing would be bumping the meter into the air and derailing it to spin to prevent the movement. But this is the part that really does make all the spinning the wheels work. So if we try it now, we press play. And we flip the car over. Press X, pop. We can see the car is upright again. So if I press up the car and I press X, boink, then it's good again. Now, quaternions are kind of a complicated subject. Very important because otherwise, there are problems that emerge from using rods that can roll. Uh, it's something called gimbal lock. We don't go into it. The thing about quaternions, though, is, is even though they're very complicated from a math perspective, as programmers in Unity, we don't actually have to understand them so much as we have to know what it is that we can do with them. And so for that, we can actually just look at the item tree for quaternion. And you'll see there's all kinds of interesting things to read in the documentation about how to use. Uh, but they're very powerful, very handy, and as long as you know what functions they call, it's actually not the end of the world if, if you have a good set of documentation that knows exactly how to do those things. It's very helpful to look at that to say, what can I do next? Now, if the car falls off the edge of the world, that's still a problem. We can upright the car if it's lit. If the car drives off the edge of the world, it's just gone. Um, there's no saving it. And you just keep tapping the upright button. And it's still driving away. But let's pretend like that never happened, because you know that, that's what we should think about uh, the way we have more time. So instead, let's make it so that if the car goes below a certain point, it will respawn at a, at a given location. So let's create two new public variables. Each of them is transformed because we want it positioned. Uh, lowest ground object. This is the indication of when the car has gone too low. And the other public transform will be respawn position. This will be where we'll set the car when we cause it to go too low. Let's do this with our update to share each frame, tell that this has happened. If the car is transformed position vertically, or uh, Y, 
his left hand to throw a stone object to the king. Dot Y. Then we want to set transform in the hard position to respawn position to the king. Now being able to just make sense, which again, kind of wonky if you haven't gotten used to it yet, but we're comparing the Y position of our tile to the Y position of the ground app if we're going to feed it. And if we were below it, we're going to set the hard position to match the position of our respawn point. Uh, that does mean that now in the editor, in, in part all, our script does want two more references. Uh, it wants the lowest ground object to be assigned and it wants respawn position. Lowest ground object is just simply the ground. So drag down and enter it. You get thrown in that, that position that way. You can also click on this thing if you want to remove a transform. Now respawn position we don't have yet. So let's create one. Uh, all we need for that is position in place. So we go to game object, create empty, which gives us a, a coordinate with rotation, but no other data associated with it. And let's just set it over here, just for just for an example, so we know that it's you know it's in position. Very clear spot because it's the right that we're starting at. Um, it's not necessarily where the car start is, but it's but you know it's a safe position. We'll call that respawn spot dimension, whatever we like. It's just there in our and now for car all, we will assign respawn spot to respawn position. And if we test our script, there we go. Car's going up towards the world, and we'll just get that back to the beginning. And so you can see there that the car is, is keeping the tumble from when it goes up into the world. Uh, another way that we can fix that is just the simplest way is we also set transform.rotation to the respawn position rotation. And now it doesn't matter that the car was up or down or fell, it will be the orientation of the respawn position. So you'll see the script spinning. Check it out, we could borrow code if we wanted from this app button to stop the car spinning and so on. Um, not terribly important to worry about makes that just a, just a more stable respawn system. And now what if we want the car to respawn exactly where the car started? I think that's a sensible expectation to, to play with. We want to put the respawn spot exactly on top of the car. And there's a very easy way to do this in Unity. Where the position coordinates of the transform are relative to a parent. So if we make respawn spot temporarily a child of car all, and then we zero out its transform data, it will spin right on the car. And we can also zero out its rotation to make it a more rotational place, where, where we already are. But now we'll make respawn spot no longer a child of car, so it won't lose any car dogs. And it recorrects the transform data to the world coordinates. So now, uh, when we respawn, we're respawning in exactly the same position as our car started in. And that's just the handy little trick in Unity to, to center one, one object's coordinates and orientation on the screen. Here are the two chunks of, of a key to crack into. And for that, we're going to go game object, create other, uh, make it out of cylinder, it makes sense to me. Uh, you can see by default, the cylinder isn't very tall. Let's make it taller, it makes sense taller. Let's make it down, yeah, that's kind of a good height. Let's make it a little bit skinnier. sort of a practice let's give it a new material asset to its material color instead of white um, speed bump let's make them brown I accidentally forgot to name it so it chose new material then I'm going to use enter on a Mac F2 on Windows we'll name that to speed bump color and then drag it onto the speed bump and then we need uh, we need a top of the tree for that I'm going to object, create other sphere, tree top, and let's, uh, let's make that grass color because we're closer enough to the tree, and it's kind of a little thin, there we go, kind of nice little tree color right there. Now we could make trunk a child of tree top or tree top a child of trunk to stay organized, 
what I recommend instead is to create a completely new Vim object create entity. Let's call this full tree. And we're going to make both the treetop and the trunk tiled with full tree. The reason for this is this allows us to keep the scale of the parent one, one, one. If you make either one of these scaled objects as tiled as the other, scale can get messy when you start to do rotation of children and so on. Uh, so I prefer to create an entity and leave that kind of as a folder that I can sort over. So we have a tree now, and uh, sure enough, we can pass input, which we always did. Oops. But let's make it so when you pass into the tree, it respawns the car. And so the first thing we'll need to do for that is create a new future object. Create a preset for an asset to a future object. We're going to name that uh, reset from track. And then inside this diff, We're not going to write any code for starting up here. Instead, we are going to write code for something called on collision enter. So that's one argument, collision, the collision. And this is code that gets called whenever a rigid body collision occurs. Car driver, other object, other object script equals the collision dot vim object dot get component uh, car driver don't just keep sending colon I realize it's short but it's kind of hard in this area of war walk to learn how, how this stuff works so and then if other object script is not equal to null we're going to call other object script dot respawn now let's go back to car driver. Let's get to the next diff. We're going to create a public function called respawn. Uh, and we'll let's actually, so here we have code already for how to respawn an update. So we're going to grab that idea. Let's just change that to a call to this function. And we're going to move that code or copy and paste it from down there up to respawn. So now if it falls to the edge of the earth, it will respawn the car, meaning it will execute this code for the car, but also if we pass it to the tree, because this function is public, we can tell it on the other object that's collided with it. And this is a really powerful way in Unity, a powerful thing to be able to do in Unity, to get a script on the other object. So it's just checking that the other object that I have a collision with has the tree. Uh, does it have the car driver script attached? And if it does, we'll call the respawn function on that object. Now we're not quite at the end, unfortunately. Because if we, if we try this now, well, so first of all, we have an attached script. So we'll go to our full tree. If we pass reset from track, but again, we're actually, we're not going to have any results yet. And this can be frustrating for Unity when you look at why doesn't it respawn me yet. And the reason is the tree has to be a rigid body. Like I said, on collision enter is an event frame from rigid body to collide, uh, but the tree is not. So let's go to component physics, rigid body. And so now, we can collide with the tree and the car should respawn. And it does. Um, I will say though that, uh, oh, our tree fell over. Uh, that's a problem. The way we need to avoid that is to tell it that this tree uh, is kinematic. We want to check mark it. Uh, that's actually the same, I believe, as setting constraints or depending on all six of these get boxes, the tree should just be in rotation. And this just tells it, don't let physics code move this object. We just want to use this to detect a collision from track. And so now we'll collide with a tree, it reset, it respawns us in the same way that if the car were driving off the edge over a tree, and it does. Next up, we're going to cover briefly the prefab system, which is a powerful way in Unity to create uh, sort of an exemplar object in a modification plane. So let's go to assets, create prefab. Over here we're going to name the prefab, I'm going to name it prefab, because I think that's quite standard. Uh, now we're going to drag full tree, the parent object, onto the tree fab. And now here's the, here's the magic. We can drag tree fab onto the ground all over the place. So we'll move these around. And each one of these is already hooked up the same way as our first tree, with a rigid body and with scripts attached and so on. 
so that when a car drives around and yells at him, he can respond to the noise. And it's even more interesting, so you'll see the HF AM position, so the position data here is in bold. You can make changes to these, so I can make the scale of bars and true fog. Let me talk on this one, let's make it uh, bigger. And then let's make it be much taller, thicker. over here, and they'll also act the same. See, there's a heat escape. It responds up, just like our lower signal capacity is. And you can take those changes, which you can see are going to highlight it in bold, and we can either be like, you know what, I didn't mean to make this be so big. I want it to be exactly the way my default true fog is. If we click on reverse, it will take it back to the properties of our, of our common true fog object here in this object. Or if we've made changes to one, like let's say I had turrets, and this actually happened in previous colors. I had turrets, and I made one of them display a little bit better by adjusting the tuning parameters, and I wanted all the turrets like that. So let's say that we decided which tree was the color that we were going for. We click on that one tree, and here in the prefab option, instead of reverse, if we click apply, it will make all the, all the prefabs pass up to the settings that were bold, except for this one. Uh, and we'll take on those, those connection requirements. Our sky is gray, which is kind of kind of an unfortunate way. This is kind of a bluish. But we want to have control over this guy. And so let's create a new material. And we'll name that sky color. And the color can blue from white here to uh, whatever shade of blue you like. There we go. There's, there's a blue for the sky. Um, let's go to edit uh, render settings is where we can set the sky box. This is also where you could set up fog if you wanted it. And we're going to drag sky color onto skybox material. You can see there it instantly filled in. And now we have the color of our sky. Uh, you could use speed maps and other kinds of things for this. I won't worry about the blue. Uh, just to give you some control, we're going to make it look a little less like a sky. And again, fog, if you want to set that as a shaded value, you know, more than welcome. Uh, let's also add text. This is a very useful basic skill. Dim object, group other, GUI text. It's going to, by default, appear in the middle of your screen. Let's set its position to 0 for the left side, 1, which is the top, 0. And the reason why that that's close to the edge is because the anchor is set to the SLS. We could change this to make it appear in the other corner if we, if we so choose. Now let's set the text for it. I'm going to say car sample from Unity. Alt-Enter is the way that I go to the next line. It may be different in Windows, but it's probably some key combination of Enter to the new line to bring the text back. Uh, so now when we play the game, those words appear there, so that's a good way to set it to work in case it gets lifted and shows up on screen on the internet. Or it's a value set, you can do whatever your whatever your needs might be. And just like any other object, you can connect this up to code to, to read out some additional data uh, and so on. So if we want to go from car to other script, say we want to draw Puzzler, GUI text, debug output. And we're going to hook up our text object to this. And with our update, let's say that we, we were really concerned with knowing uh, the car's X position for whatever reason. Then we'll send a set to debug output with this string. Uh, empty string plus whatever will make a string out of this visually. Uh, so we're going to set the text property of our GUI text to the X position of the car. And then once we get under car all that we have to hook up debug output to our GUI text object. So this is the ID data for debug output. So we'll give car all selected and inspector. And now as I drive around, you can see that value. And so this of course is a handy way to provide arbitrary context uh, or even spatial requirement data as you're working out the bugs that you need to do. Let's go to the next one again. Uh, one last thing that we also need to account for is we need to find code that we know will always be running. In our case, the car driver seems pretty safe. But we can be careful of that if, if the car got removed from the universe or it exploded, this code will no longer run. We need to put the, what I'm about to show you in code that will always be running. So for this program, we know it's true. 
What's the input that gets to P code that escape? So if the user presses the escape key, then we're going to do application dot push. This will not show up in a web version. This will not work inside the Unity editor, but this is absolutely essential if you are doing a local Windows or Macintosh build so if someone can switch your game, without having to control it, delete it, or exit it. Um, it's, it's a little insane to me if this isn't built into your program, but uh, you know, uh, developers be warned, add this to your program, because it will save you trouble in the case of users like this. So again, let's get to what didn't happen here, but when you export the program now, you can use escape and push, and it'll be very simple. This is schematic, but for making a build. So let's go to File, uh, Build Settings, and we can select the Unity file. Here we can tell what we want a Mac OS X build. You can select build, and it'll say what it's used where we want to put it. I like to create a, a, a folder called Deploy inside my project and save all my outputs there. Tar Mac, get it. Um, it'll take a second to output that the project information, and it'll show us the version. And I can now run that. It all, by default, lets me choose my properties. Like I said, get into the dev check option. Uh, it'll check escape. It'll close that since we added that input and save. Uh, you can also output the PC, the Windows build, even on Mac. Again, I like to just put it in my display folder. Our PC is kind of a stressful deal. I don't know if it's one of the same design as mine. Take it a moment. And then what other things you can do is you can output the web player. Uh, all these, of course, are free. Uh, with Unity, you have to pay for the other output options. Uh, but one of them breaks the Mac. Uh, deploy. Tar web. And when you output the web, it'll give you an HTML file uh, with the file already embedded. Tar Unity, tar HTML. And so this is actually all that I had to do to output the sample build that I showed at the start of this uh, walkthrough was the output and build this way and placing that HTML file into the web. And again, as I said, let's get to the Mario Kart up here. And I hope you've had a good time with all this tutorial. Um, I know it's not beautiful, but hopefully it's enough to get some people started and exploring Unity and all the great things you can do with it. If you've got questions, please let me know. I'd be happy to answer them. I might do a follow-up video showing sound uh, and various other kind of stuff, camera techniques. Uh, but uh, if if you want the full source code, check it out. It's going to be on the blog entry at hobbygamedev.com. Thanks again. Have a good time with it. Bye-bye.